everyone is tired of the mummies of ancient Egypt. It is impossible to look endlessly at all these sarcophagi, pharaohs, scarabs, and other archetypal elements of Egyptian culture. That's why today we're going to talk about other mummies and modern ones, and if you think that mummification is still in the distant past, then you are deeply mistaken. Mummification as a ritual means of preserving the body was common in dozens, if not hundreds of ancient cultures. Go to any old church. The relics of saints are a classic way of mummification. They are also stored intentionally, placed in the right climatic conditions. Mummies are a mandatory part of modern Christian culture. How many mummies did atheism create? For example, the mausoleum on Red Square, where Lianian rests. There are many ways to preserve remains. The Egyptians removed internal organs from the bodies, placed the remains in alkali, and then bandaged them, injecting abundant incense and preservative compounds into the corpse. In other cultures, the bodies were filled with tar, bitumen, salts, honey. But today, we will not talk about mummification methods and not about traditions, but about the dead, who experienced more adventures after death than during their lifetime. The bodies of many famous criminals were put on public display. Photographers photographed those who wanted to, next to the body of Jesse James and the severed head of Joaquin Murrieta. But the little robber Elmer McCurdy, who was not known to anyone except the police, posthumously knocked everyone down. McCurdy was younger than the famous bandits of the Wild West. 1880. The year they retired, he had just been born. 1911. Elmer and the bandits robbed a train on the Missouri Railroad. This turned out to be unsuccessful, and Curdy did not count on nitroglycerin, and most of the money was burned as a result of the explosion. With even less success, they robbed a bank in Kansas. The bandits couldn't open the safe. The culmination of the failure was the second train robbery. The bandits thought they had hit a big jackpot, but the catch was $46, two bottles of whiskey, a couple of revolvers, and a conductor's watch. The newspapers joked that it was the smallest train robbery in history. According to the documents, McCurdy was found and killed in a shootout on October 8, 1911. His empty life ended, and an active, blood-filled death began. The body of the unfortunate robber fell into the hands of Joseph Johnson, the owner of a funeral home in the city of Pahasco, Oklahoma. Since no one came for McCurdy, Johnson embalmed him using a method similar to that later used to embalm Lianian, shaved him, washed him, dressed him, and displayed him in the window of his office as an advertisement. He attached a sign to the body with the inscription the robber who did not give up. People came to Johnson to look at the robber, and at the same time relatives ordered something for the grave, for example, a wreath or a tombstone. An order was also given to embalm the body. But in 1916, two men came to Johnson, who introduced themselves as the McCurdy brothers, who had come to bury a relative. Johnson gave the body on receipt. The only brothers were James and Charles Patterson, owners of a traveling circus. The fame of the embalmed bandit spread far beyond Pahaska, and the circus performers decided that it would be nice to arrange a performance about him. From 1916 to 1922, McCurdy exhibited at the Patterson Circus under the inscription The Bandit Who Could Not Be Taken Alive. It was then sold to Louis Sonny, owner of the Museum of Moving Crimes. McCurdy had many adventures. For example, in 1933, it was part of an exhibition that followed the Trans-American Marathon from Los Angeles to New York, and was later used by director Dwayne Esper to promote a drug movie. The director put the corpse in the cinema on the day of the premiere, and it was written over the body that he personally killed the drug addict Esper. Sonny died in 1949, and McCurdy's mummy was placed in reserve. She didn't look so alive before her skin dried up, her body shrunk. 1964. Lewis' son sold the mummy to director David Friedman, another master of cinematography. Friedman used McCurdy as a prop in the movie She's a Freak. In 1968, the mummy passed to Canadian businessman Spoonie Singh, the owner of one of the most famous wax museums, Hollywood. Spoonie bought up all the wax figures left over from filming, they were often used as dead men. By that time, the mummy was covered with a layer of wax, and McCurdy was no longer recognizable. 
But there was an incident. Singh handed over the mummy to Canadians who needed wax figures for a show on Mount Rushmore, and there a strong wind damaged the body. Disgruntled Canadians returned McCurdy with broken fingers and earlobes to Singh, and he resold the circumcised body to Ed Lersh, the owner of an amusement park in Long Beach. McCurdy began playing the executioner in the local panic room. Fate had mercy on him only in 1976, when the fantastic series The Man for Six Million Dollars was filmed in Lersha Park. One of the participants in the filming touched the wax mannequin, it split, and human bones were found inside. An investigation has begun, one of the most difficult for forensic experts of all time. An embalmed man killed by a bullet in the chest could have died five years ago or a hundred. According to the rare composition of obsolete embalming material and the analysis of the bullet hole, it was determined that the body was old and a 1920 for penny and a ticket to the Lewis Sunny crime. Museum were found in the throat. Elmer McCurdy has been identified. On April 22, 1977, 66 years after his death, the body of the ill-fated bandit was interred in Guthrie, Oklahoma, not far from the grave of another famous, albeit during his lifetime, robber Bill. Doolin, the exact resting place of McCurdy was classified, there was no body under the tombstone itself, so that the legendary corpse would not be stolen. Eighty years before McCurdy, the rich and respected writer and philosopher Jeremy Bentham died in London. He was considered the predecessor of Marx and generally a progressive man by the standards of the 18th to 19th centuries. Bentham advocated for gender equality, freedom of speech, the prohibition of slavery, and so on. During his lifetime, Bentham became famous as a philosopher and orator, and was also rich. He bequeathed part of his fortune to the University of London, but the terms of the will were strange. Bentham demanded that his body be publicly dissected for educational purposes, and then mummified and put on public display in a certain pose. The autopsy was performed to days after Bentham's death in the presence of medical school students. The skeleton and embalmed head were preserved. The skeleton was dressed in the coat and trousers of the deceased, the head fixed, so that the structure looked exactly like a living Bentham sitting on a chair and looking into the distance. The cabinet with the philosopher's name engraved on it was made especially for the corpse. The doors opened and Bentham was inside, like a lively, handsome man. The body was transferred to the university college, where it is displayed in the main building to this day. Three times in honor of the anniversaries of the college, Bentham took part in the meetings of the academic council and was noted as present, but did not vote. By the beginning of the XX century, the mummy looked doubtful the embalming technique was still imperfect, and such bodies required constant care. In addition, students often mocked the exhibition and wrote obscenities on Bentham's forehead. Therefore, the original head was replaced with a wax when the skeleton inside remained native. Bentham is still there today. The original head is also not buried, but stored indoors. You can look at the mummy online. This is an 180-degree view of Bentham's body in the pose in which he sometimes attends meetings of the Scientific Council, truly an immortal philosopher. The story of the mummification of London taxi driver Alan Billis is amazing. In 2009, he, a 60-year-old man, was diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer, and Mr. Billis had at most six months to live. But he was a non-religious and cheerful person, and also respected science. Therefore, he decided to bequeath his body to science, but not for research in the field of oncology there are enough such volunteers without him. No, Billis bequeathed the body to archaeologists, Stefan Buckley's research group, which studied Egyptian mummification techniques. In fact, all they needed was a corpse. Billis decided to become the first person in 3,000 years to be mummified in the Egyptian way. Before his death, he joked that he would receive the posthumous name Chutan Allen and expressed the hope that children would remember him not as an ordinary taxi driver, but as a person who did. Something special. Allen died on January 14, 2010, and was sent to Sheffield Medical Center, where everything was already prepared for mummification. The process was recorded on video, which was later included in a documentary for Channel 4. In addition to the operation, there is an interview with Billis and his family. The experiment was conducted as close as possible to historical sources. The internal organs were removed through a small lateral incision, and the heart and brain were left in the body as was done in Egypt. The body was disinfected, covered with a mixture of resin, 
beeswax, vegetable oil, and other components that were used in mummification. The corpse was soaked in a solution of salts, dried and wrapped in cloth. The process lasted several months. Today the body of Alan Billis is kept in Sheffield. His condition is being closely monitored, but it will take a couple of thousand years to determine whether the reconstruction was carried out correctly. Alan has them. He's in no hurry. In 1840, Gottfried No, a 27-year-old German doctor, came to La Guaira, a city in northern Venezuela. Shortly after graduating from the University of Freiburg, he led an extensive practice, became famous as a fighter against cholera, bought a hacienda and prospered. But in the 1850s, the civil war began. Wounded people came to the doctor, and many died in his hospital, and he was thinking about how not to let the bodies rot. Around the same time, No developed an aluminum chloride embalming fluid and began experimenting on the deceased in his laboratory in Bonavista. By 1901, Dr. No, he had embalmed several hundred bodies, and some of them were kept alive for many years. No did not write down the formula of his bomb, and it was lost. The most amazing thing was that she preserved bodies without removing organs. It was similar to the method of plastination invented a hundred years later by Gunther von Hagens, that is, replacing the water and lipids of the human body with synthetic resins. But at the time of No, such technology was impossible. In 1874, No's brother, Wilhelm, died. Gottfried embalmed him and at the same time founded the Buna Vista Mausoleum, which became the family crypt. In 1879, his daughter Anna was buried there, and later her husband Heinrich Muller. Gottfried himself, after his death, was given the correct dosage of a pre-prepared bomb by his cousin Amalia. She remained the last resident of the Hacienda until 1926, after which the mausoleum and the estate remained unattended and vandalized for three years. In 1929, researchers opened the mausoleum and sent the mummies of No's family to the laboratory, but they could not restore the formula of his bomb. Many families in the region still keep the mummies of relatives embalmed by Noe. Students of medical universities in South America regularly come here in the hope of revealing the secret of the German doctor. The mausoleum and hacienda are now located on the territory of the Villa National Park. If you are in Venezuela, come in. Japanese Buddhist monks voluntarily devote up to five to six years of their lives to the process of self-mummification. This tradition existed only in Yamagata Prefecture and only among Vajrayana Buddhists. It existed from about the 11th to the 19th century. There are 24 successful cases of self-mummification, although, most likely, many more monks went through this process. It's just that their attempts failed, and the bodies decomposed. The Sokushin Butsu process lasted from 3,000 to 3,500 days. It was based on the strictest diet of Mokujikiji eating wood, the absorption of cones, bark, resin, and other products of woody origin. Thanks to this, the body lost all fat and accumulated urushal, a specific oily toxin underlying Japanese and Chinese lacquers. In addition, like a lacquered box, urushal can preserve the human body. Also, the monks gradually reduced the amount of moisture consumed, which led to the drying of the body and internal organs. Many monks died in the middle of the process not surprising with such a diet, but some reached the end. They went down into a special pit and took a pose convenient for meditation, and the pit was walled up from above. Three years later, it was opened to make sure of the monks' natural mummification. Similar cases, however isolated, were recorded in China and India. The natural mummification of the buried religious leader Dashi Dorju Idijalov is close to Sokusen Butsu. He died in 1927, and his incorruptible body is located in the Volzhinsky Datsun to the west of Yulanud. Scientists examined samples taken from the mummy of Idijalov and confirmed that the degree of its preservation is incredible. In 2008, Claude Rex Noel, also known as Corky King, Corky Ra and Summon Bonum Amon Ra, died in the United States. Noel was the founder of a sect based on ancient Egyptian religious practices. As in all such cases, the sect primarily served as a source of income. But it doesn't matter. Noel invented the Summum religion in 1975, ostensibly to share the fruits of truth obtained from the universal ether. In 1980, he changed his name to Summum Bonum Amon Ra to show everyone his metaphysical essence. Back in 1978, he built a pyramid to collect and charge the divine nectar summum soma.
The fact is that in Utah, where he lived at that time, the production of alcohol is prohibited, but there are many benefits for religious organizations. Noel simply produced wine as part of a religious cult and sold it on the territory of the community, which did not contradict the laws. That's the whole religion. Noel had many businesses under the Summon brand, but he founded the most original of them in the mid-2000s. He registered with the Funeral Services Bureau, where he offered. That's right, mummification. Egypt is the same. The process consisted of soaking the body in a saline solution for 77 days and in general resembled the mummification of Alan Billis, only without a scientific basis. During this process, religious mantras had to be recited over the body so that it could be better mummified. This concludes the conversation about unusual mummies. Watch other videos, subscribe and click on the bell, so as not to miss the most interesting. See you soon, friends, thank you for watching.